You're tuned in to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder. This week, I have Geraldine Cooper-Smith, the head of talent and programming for a company named Form Life. She worked for Equinox in New York and went up into the Northwest as well, but now Southern California, and she's working with home fitness equipment on the tech side. I hope you'll enjoy this show, and be sure to subscribe. Do you find yourself, do you like public speaking? I do, but I do a lot of prep, you know, joking about it, but I do a tremendous, I have to be over prepared to feel very comfortable presenting in, in those environments, especially it's for my colleagues who I respect so much and yeah. I really want to bring value. Yeah, for sure. And uh, just a little sneak peek. We don't have to go deep into it. Of course, yeah. you're, you're making the preparations, but your, the, the presentation title, you know, what are you speaking on? Uh, it's uh, reigniting your spark and how to keep long-term sustainable career in the fitness industry. And I find a lot of people are just burnt out very quickly in this industry, so much of the same and maxing out on their ability to earn more. And so many people, it pains me when I'll be like, whatever happened to so-and-so? They're like, oh, they sell cars. And I'm like, did they want to sell cars? Like, well, no, but his brother had a dealership and it just like, this is, should be avoidable. Like there's ways from you know how how they think about monetizing their career and, and growing their business and also the psychological things you need to do to to stay passionate and engaged because it can become if you're not careful it can become babysitting and rep counting which <laughs> is yeah. really not a fun place to be no i truly i fell into that rut myself and and to the point where you know i should be able to count to 10 in any world language that's how often you <laughs> exactly. did it right <laughs> crazy exactly. and there are times where did you work out today or did you work out this week no i didn't i'm just this is my only workout why are you putting that burden on my shoulders this is something right. here i'm supposed to be your guide like you say not a babysitter so boy that does so you've got some helpful hints to, to try to yeah. counteract that i imagine yeah. that's great i've lived and, it you know and i yeah I come out on the other side of it <laughs> I think we both started roughly around the same time, although you started when you were about six years old. I started I in my 20s <laughs> and we've been doing it for 30 years, right? Yeah, bless you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I started at, at, I've been in the industry over 30 years now. I started about 25. So um, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, no, it goes fast. To it. I'm curious what, what, I mean, you probably very active you were into fitness and then you found a way to make it into a career is that how it happened yeah kind of sort of I was the person in high school who was trying to find out how I could get out of going to gym class like oh maybe my knee hurt wink wink <laughs> could somebody write me a note <laughs> I hated it I had an allergy to it in my mind and never did anything athletic and some of it's generational I think I'm the last generation where women were mostly cheerleaders like, like that was the thing and if you were doing anything else it was sort of unfeminine and you were looked at well as less attractive or you know less uh, somebody would someone would want to date at some point to be quite honest so <laughs> so uh, most girls women we would say oh no I want to be a cheerleader or if you like me weren't coordinated enough to be a cheerleader you just stayed out of there altogether and then when I got to college I started it, doing more things, physical things. I took a class actually that was, I was a theater major and we took a, a theater movement class that ended up being a really strenuous workout that I, in retrospect, looks very much like animal flow, uh -huh. uh, you know, that type of things. And I hadn't moved like that. And I thought, why is this so challenging? And they were asking us to do it. And we were, you know, working through different characters and there was a whole theatrical component to it as well must have looked really weird if you didn't have context of what you were looking at but it was an incredible workout and it just taught me so much about there's so much of this body of mind that I don't have access to of control of um, dominion over in a good way and I started to really get into working out and then all of a sudden I realized my body changed but more importantly my confidence changed and I wanted to share that with people and I didn't think you could have that as a career because personal training was at that point, the domain of like celebrities and uber, uber wealthy outlying people. It was not yeah. as ubiquitous as it is now. So I ended up going into advertising and my first week in my first job, I thought, oh, this is not going to work. I do not like this place. You know, fluorescent lights that look like something out of the Dilbert cartoon, everybody <laughs> looking miserable in small cubicles and honest to God, my first thought walking in the door was how many years until you can retire? 
it's not oh. really a good thing to think of on day one. <laughs> oh, already thinking about when can I get out of here? So I went through this quarter life crisis and started to look into what I could do. And I eventually became a group exercise instructor because that was more of a thing. It wasn't really a, even a career because right. you teach three to five classes a day and then in very short order, you had your shin splints and your itises of various types. But uh, we thought we were bulletproof and we could do it forever. And then I started to do personal training and it went from there, but it was a passion, ultimately a passion through my own personal journey. You got to love that. I, I, you know, we're kind of parallel in that way, except instead of trying to get out of gym class, I was trying to get into it because that was an easy A. And it meant oh, I didn't nice. have to do anything, you know. And when it got into college, instead of studying for the, the finals, I you'd find me working out in the gym. And and I I'll vividly recall, honestly, Geraldine, I, there was one day I was walking across campus. I don't recommend this to, to anybody listening, but I, I, I realized I was passing a building where I should be in sitting in a lecture and I don't re even recall what it was one of those big lecture halls with 200 people in it and you're just a number or whatever and I'm like you know what I, I don't have anything going on right now I, I might as well stop in and, and see where we are and so I sat down and everyone's got their books opened feverishly combing through all their information and it dawned on me wow I think we have an exam today so oh, I just, no. yeah, that's yeah. So, so that was like a bad yeah. dream. <laughs> oh it, yeah. It, but I was living it and it was so amazing. And, and fortunately I'm, I'm very good at, at exam taking and, and there's, there's themes and, and patterns that emerge and you get to see it. And, and so I think I did all right. I don't know. I don't recall what the, uh, the final outcome was. I do know that I walked away with a college degree and a heck of a lot of muscle on my body from going to the gym, like you say. And then for mm -hmm. me, I just happened to be uh, out of a job after school. And, and of course, this is early, like late 80s, early 90s, when we're in a recession and the Gulf War is about to kick off. And my, my roommate looked through the classifieds and said, hey, there's this gym that is hiring. It was just happenstance. It was just serendipitous. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, r roughly the same time when personal training wasn't really thought of. And then there was a guy from Orange County where you're, you're now residing. Mm -hmm. And he moved up to the Central Coast and he was a fitness director at this club and he began something called personal training and mm. so became one of the first trainers here in Santa Cruz. There was a couple, you know, uh, trainers with their own studios, but in the clubs, they didn't have that going on. So yeah. I feel it. I, I know what you mean. Like, um, and so we've seen it. You and I have yeah. been through kind of the trenches of, of absurd fitness, right? Yep. And, <laughs> and you think about the group exercise, my gosh. Um, we, we've had the step aerobics, which I think there's probably gyms out there still doing step aerobics. We had the I slide see them boards, in there. <laughs> right? We had the body blade. We had um, the slide. The, slide. Taught slide. the slide. Yeah, I, I had body uh, walk for rebound. Spalding in the park. sport ropes. Do you remember the spalding sport ropes? All those weighted yep. jump ropes. I still have them hanging in the studio. They're good. Uh, crazy, huh? Yeah. So, we've seen it. so I guess this leads me into the the fad of fitness. Uh, with the, what is the flavor of the month or flavor of the year? And there's some underpinnings that remain constant through it all. But do you, what do you see? I, I'm not going to ask you for prognostication or anything, but um, mm. you're, you've got definitely your thumb on the pulse of conditioning and training. What is, what's on the forefront now? What's, what's I mean, out there? I think leveraging tech in a more intelligent way is definitely and that's the space that I'm working in now and I see it more and more it's so interesting because if you had asked me this pre-pandemic I would have given you a very different answer but I think the ability now to leverage tech technology and and platforms to unlock fitness for more people who maybe don't want to go to a gym can't go to a gym can't get access to good coaching where they live I think just taking that localization friction out of it is really a powerful unlock for the industry mm -hmm. and I think it's going to make coaching and training and expertise that we deliver as professionals available to many more people at scale than it would before because you know we used to always hear well make sure you're thinking about your serviceable market is five to ten miles you know it's five to ten minutes rather outside of where your gym is that's not the case anymore and that is huge for us as fitness professionals it means we can scale ourselves better we're you know, maybe I don't have an 11 o'clock client on the East Coast, but I probably could get an eight o'clock client on the West Coast. So it just gives more opportunity. I think also as a mom who uh, had a, at one point, you know, was staying at home with my son, 
I really wanted to go back and train my clients in New York City, but I was 62 miles away from where I lived with my kid. I wasn't going anywhere. I could yeah. have done this remote hybrid situation where I could have still worked with the clients that I wanted to work with back in New York City, and none of that was available. So I, I think it's interesting. The customer is ready for it, and the mindset has shifted, and the technology is now there to support it. So I, I think we're just starting to see the possibilities in that space. Okay, what was your answer going to be pre-pandemic? Because you had an answer, you said, but you changed it since the pandemic. Pre-pandemic, and I still think this is very viable, I think we're going to move more and more into the ability to control your body in through self-limiting exercises. I mentioned animal flow before. I think of kettlebells actually as another type of self-limiting exercise in many ways. Uh, yoga, where... If you can't do it, you can't really do it. It's, you're figuring it out. There's that motor learning component baked into it. And I think it's such an unlock for people to understand the ability to control their, their instrument, control their body. And it, once you get all of the initial, why can't I do this? Why is this so difficult? Then there is this gradual unlock and mastery of, wow, I couldn't do that a couple of weeks ago and look at how I'm moving. And I, I think... It, when people get a taste of that, it becomes, it, it's very, uh, it's like martial arts is, is another one of those self-limiting exercises where you, you can really, in my mind, only get into so much trouble because it's a lot of, a lot of it, kettlebells are a different story, but a, a lot of it is body weight and you just trying to navigate space with your own body. I think people are going to find a lot of satisfaction in that. And I think there's a lot of open space to give people the ability to work out wherever they are, whenever they want to, without equipment and still be challenged. Do you think with the advent of all this technology for moving the body, whether we're talking just online consultations with trainers or companies like Peloton and Mirror, where they're bringing exercise into someone's home with some type of virtual guidance or classes, is, is that going to help this kind of, I won't say a battle on obesity or war on obesity, but war on um, sedentary lifestyle. How about that? Because it's yeah. ever increasing. We are, we are a larger nation per mm -hmm. person, per capita yeah. than uh, before personal training began. So mm -hmm. we can't say that we're, we're actually even waging a battle. I think we're just having a narrow demographic to the people that are really looking for fitness, but then the larger population, the more, the majority aren't necessarily in that category, but I could see it kind of broadening just a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's tremendous opportunity to touch more people and to get more people engaged in ways that are accessible, less intimidating, um, you know, minimal effective dosage type things, because I, I think one of the things we combat and we don't always do ourselves a service when we show up as perfect specimens, not that we shouldn't be fit, but that's intimidating to people. And we show up with programs that we think of as beginner and then someone tries to do it and they're sore for a week and they think exercise is horrible and painful. And well, why would you come back to put the sharp stick in your eye again? You know, it, I think all of that is not serving us as a profession. And if we were smarter and had, you know, short little things that people could do multiple times per day, because we know the science shows that there's, you, you could do the 40 minutes or you could do those 10 minutes four times and you're getting pretty close to the same benefit. And at the end of the day, if people aren't going to do it, you're getting zero benefit. So the compliance is, is, is going to be much better, we would hope. And also the ability to have it in your home where you're not as intimidated that you don't look like everybody else at the gym. You're not as intimidated that you might be making a fool of yourself and doing it wrong. I think those things, um, connected fitness could serve there. And the ability to just be reminded, hey, just get up and we're just going to move for five minutes. And we don't need to overthink it. And, and that might look like to us a dynamic warm up, but think about the cumulative effect of someone doing those things from, you know, metabolic, you know, posture, all, all of these pieces that would, the, the benefits stacking up over time, if we just had these little snackable fitness moments throughout a person's day that were accessible.
Yeah, I like snackable. I like the concept of it. You know, small uh, bite-sized morsels constantly throughout the day, whether we're talking diet or exercise, it kind of makes yeah. sense for both of them. Now, yeah. with your career path, I want to kind of get back to that because you were in New York, you're, um, you're an emerging personal trainer, you're seeing clients in the Big Apple, and but you changed your career path. You started doing working in Equinox and, and other locations. What how, how did that go? What what made yeah. you uh, kind of pull away from the hour to hour client training and get more into the educational kind of counseling or consulting component? Yeah, I mean, it was it, it really about passion. Again, when I started working at an independent training facility as a as a trainer, um, subcontractor at, at the place, I started doing more teaching and more educating of their trainers. And I thought this is the most fun part of my my day. I love this. And eventually I went on staff and became the manager. And I did a tremendous amount of training of that facility. And that took me into different paths. You know this, when you are passionate about something, all these doors start to open. It, it feels like serendipity, you know, just all of a sudden Marymount Manhattan College was calling, did I want to teach a course? Yeah, I do. And that's right around the corner from where I live. So I taught a course for, for years. Um, that was the last course in a certification program that they had, which was tremendously gratifying while I'm developing these trainers. So that brought me into more learning and development and management. And then I took some time off, like I said, to, to have my son. I was home with him as a stay-at-home mom with just a few personal clients coming to private clients coming to me. Um, and then I went back in and ended up working for Equinox. I originally came on as a manager, but they found out I had this learning and development background. And that's also what my what my graduate degree is in um, is exercise science, but from Teachers College, Columbia. So it's geared toward how do you transfer this information to other people. So I love that. And I ended up in charge of the Equinox Fitness Training Institute, which is a job that I had for 10 years and title changed and the number of humans that we touched changed. But that was a, a really amazing opportunity to touch not only the personal training program at Equinox, but all these people who are new to the profession who came in so well intended and wanting to learn and we could provide them with great education and opportunity to have a career. So that was huge. And then through that, I, I had an opportunity, Nike reached out to me and asked me would I be interested in taking this role. And it was a role where I was supposed to be in charge of something called Spark. I don't even know if you remember this, but Nike- I do remember training. Spark. Yeah. Yeah, so really? I was hired to be the, the global director of Spark, and I moved my family across the country for that job. And the first weekend, they decided they were going to close that. And the, after I moved my family, I still had a job. So that was the good news. But I ended up in brand marketing, which all these things, so many of them are blessings in disguise. So I'm thinking, why am I in brand marketing? It took me full circle back to advertising in the very beginning of my career. <laughs> Interesting. And yeah. I became the subject matter expert in-house within this one particular part of Nike, which was tremendous because I had an opportunity to, they said, well, what do you think we should do to be more credible in this space? And I said, I, I think we can upgrade the app. It's a, it's a good app and it has the potential to touch so many lives. We should really lean in and do as much as we can. So we, I spent a, the bulk of my time being the captain of that progress that we made on upgrading the app, which took almost three years. That was the hardest work and some of the most gratifying work that I ever did. I got to leverage my network and bring people in to do programming for us and change the way that the company thought about the, the app and, and what content should be on it. That was super cool. And then I ended up having an opportunity. The president of Equinox became the CEO of Flywheel Sports. And I had known her from Equinox and it had always been a dream of mine to work with her, Sarah Rob O'Hagan, one of my mentors. So I took a job back in New York when I was living in Oregon and my son was in high school. So I wasn't going to move him. He was He'd settled nicely from Connecticut to Oregon. So I ended up have, being bi-coastal for almost two years. Um, into, yeah, so that was, it was a great job and I loved it. But at some point, just the commute, I mean, commute in air oh. quotes, um, became a little too much. And then I ended up ultimately with um, Exos, formerly Athletes Performance. And I was there for, through the pandemic journey. So I was hired to be, a uh, again, now more in a business lens to be in charge of helping sell services, personal training, small group training, and actually digital training 
to the existing fitness center management clients that they had. And then the pandemic came and a lot of facilities were closed down. So I pivoted back into learning and development. And I was there for about two years and now I'm at Form. And my role here, it's, a, it's an amazing startup connected um, fitness platform that uh, has a mirror-like device plus resistance arms that you can add on plus VOD content that streams through it and live one-on-one. -on -one. And my current role here is head of corporate wellness. So trying to figure out how we leverage technology to reach more people in their homes and when they're going back to work. So I'm dealing with that kind of B2B side of the business. Wow, that's that's a great kind of, uh, how would I say it? Just adventure. Like yeah. you, you've gone through so many, down so many different trails and seen so much different uh, kind of scenery and, and some things had thorns in it maybe, but other things that were blossoming and smelling just as sweet and tropical as can be. So, uh, yeah. So obviously it's you really pursue challenges. You really like mm -hmm. to kind of not just keep counting to 10 and, and showing people how to put weights up and down. Do you, do you see with form, like obviously you can see so many tangents that they can reach out to different markets. One thing I'm curious about is what about the medical community? Because mm. I gotta say, I scratch my head I've, I've had great contracts with our local hospital here for several years, just pre COVID. And of yeah. course, you know, that you can, you obviously, you know, what happens when, when COVID hit, everything shut down in the hospitals because mm -hmm. that was just, they were making room for everything else. Terrible. Um, yeah. But, but I've, I've gone through the medical fitness association, MFA and, and spoke uh, at a couple of their kind of conferences and whatnot, but it, there is something about the medical community, and this is not a slam necessarily. Yeah. I think I, if I could just explain too, like in, in medical school, doctors, they spend so much time with surgical techniques and procedures and prescription medication, and understanding that, that the amount of time they actually spend in understanding complete integrative biomechanics of the body and true anatomy in terms of functional movements, and not mm -hmm. to mention nutrition and diet, it, it, is, it is something that they keep in the closet, and but the majority of what they're learning in the grand hall has nothing to do with that. So I can see how medical fitness is a little bit behind, but do you see an opportunity there with Form or with, with anybody else in the industry? Yeah, I, 100%. It's a, the medical community is based on disease and the treatment of disease, not the prevention of disease. And right. there is so much now we're seeing more and more of this with functional medicine practitioners and more, uh, you know, naturopaths and these type of profession becoming more mainstream. But I think that's so much white space of changing the paradigm in people's mind, including the medical profession, that if we start from a place of optimizing for health and wellness, a lot of disease will take care of itself as opposed to you know, waiting until things are broken and then we try to patch people back together. And I think just to have that ability to coach people remotely in their homes is a very powerful thing because yeah. uh, these things are very intimate. You don't want to talk about your bad diet in the middle of a gym floor with, you know, so-and-so hard body next to you. It's intimidating, but in the privacy of your home, you might be willing to say, yeah, you know, this is what's going on and this is what I'm wrestling with and how, how can we strategize together and coach? See, that's what I think is like a team approach with a device such as that mirror coming through. And not only do you have exercise arms and whatnot to do, and you've got a trainer, but what if there was a combination where we're going to, we're going to connect you with a functional medicine doctor and we've mm -hmm. got a registered dietitian or a, a nutritionist on staff and we're going to also, we're going to bring in a, a psychologist or a therapist. And, and, and we've got all of this right there in your living room, in your bedroom, whatever. And you can have these little 15 minute consultations and have four people in, in one hour giving you just a little bit of encouragement to go on. How's your eating been? Let's get a plan on that. How's your exercise been? Let's tweak this a little bit here and there. And hey, I just got your blood results back and these are looking good. I think you need to come in and see me for this or that. I mean, mm -hmm. Wide open. I, that's wide open. I think that's the future. I think that's where we're all heading. Uh, you know, I think the individuals need this type of, of care. It's not always 
easy for them to know where to find it. So they end up Googling best exercise for good abs. It's a worthy I, idea that that's where you would go to find information and, and sure, but like we can curate that information for you and we can customize that information as professionals in a way that if I'm just grabbing information, it might be great, but it might not be right for me. That's the other thing. Even when it's quality information, the fact that it's not individualized for, for that person is often problematic. Uh, yeah. Just to, to have those best in class experts giving great advice that's tailored to the individual, that the unlock there, the amount of healthcare costs we could re reduce, the amount of comorbidities, it's staggering to me, the, the possibility there. I, People don't know what they don't know is another part of it. And sometimes we've all experienced this as trainers where you, I had a client once who came to me and her reason for coming to me was she's a model and she wanted to have a, a bigger butt. Well, doesn't I, everybody. You know, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I said, okay, I, I said, you know, I didn't fully explain to her how I was going to approach that, but in the service of giving her a well-rounded program, one day she said, you know what's so great about this workout? These workouts is like, not only do I look better, but my back doesn't hurt when I wash my face. She was 31 at the time. And I oh, said, wait, gosh. wait. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She goes, you know, like when you wash your face, how your back hurts. I said, honestly, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You're 31, your back should not hurt when you wash your face. Bending over the sink to wash your face should not cause pain. That's not normal. But in her mind, it had been going on since her 20s. She thought that was normal. And she didn't come to me for, she came in through the door of aesthetics. I'll take it. But she left in a place where she would, her functionally, she was a different person and she got all these benefits. She didn't even know were available to her. So I think that's the Trojan horse here, you know, come in for good abs. Hey, back pain goes away, you know. Stay for knowledge, right. Exactly. Okay, so on your next think tank, this is where you're going to promote. I mean, I, oh, I mean yeah. we're, we're both in California. Dignity Health is one of the largest health networks in California. I think they're in Arizona and a few other states. But Dignity Health is it runs the hospital here in Santa Cruz that I was working with. And, yeah. and it's it was I was hoping that it was going to be this program that would show the efficacy of having something preventive, especially when we're teaching senior strength conditioning to mm -hmm. the septuagenarians, octogenarians, and, mm -hmm. and older. We had mm -hmm. uh, exercise for people living with Parkinson's or a balance class or a whole bunch of different things we were doing. And, and the hope was they were going to take this and try to implement it into all these other places. However, mm -hmm. that would be costly compared to what you're offering right there, the, the possibility of it. Just, yeah. just planting seeds, that's all I'm going yeah, to do no, there. And yeah, no, we've had the early conversations on the, you know, the potential, which we see as, yeah. as pretty much unlimited. And it's, it's an unlock, it's an enablement device that gives expertise, uh, access to expertise to people who ordinarily wouldn't have it, you know, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, well, and, and you mentioned something else with this woman who's washing her face and her back hurts. That is, that shouldn't be commonplace. However, more and more it is. That's right. Uh, partly because of, uh, unfortunately, because technology has reduced the need to move our bodies quite so much. So mm -hmm. instead of even commuting to work, we've got people that just wake up, roll out of the bed, and they just hit their, their power button on their laptop or wherever. And they sit there all day long. They don't even have to get up and go anywhere because they're probably working from their kitchen. So all they do is walk to the refrigerator, get some yep. food, and they're back to work. So the, their boss is like it because the, the productivity is even higher than before because there's re really little downtime. But from our perspective, like from my, my business model, it used to be that we were doing um, elite athletic training and recreational athletes. But every passing year from the early 90s to today, the majority of people I deal with are chronic and acute pain sufferers. Mm -hmm. and, and they, from a business perspective, are going to be more likely to pay whatever they need to get out of pain so they can have their life yeah. back. And I don't like to prey upon the pain. It just so happens, like you say, serendipity, that this is just the way it is. 50% of, of the people in society are living in some form of orthopedic pain, partly yeah. because they're moving too much or not enough. Yeah, so or, or, in the, or ways that are not appropriate for their body, with right. no customization or, or, or acknowledgement of that. Yeah, it's, I, I don't think we're preying on people who are in pain. I think we're giving a huge unlock that saves them from 
downing a handful of NSAIDs every single day and going, you know, buying this brace and that brace and doing things that actually decrease their ability to move, furthering this cycle, I think we are the unlock for so much of this unnecessary suffering in my mind because people don't know what they don't know and they don't have the expertise to guide them to simple things. I mean, just even hydration, when you look at some, I mean, how many of our clients come in and we say, hey, did you have any water today? Well, I had a glass of water this morning. Uh, well, it's five o'clock. <laughs> A glass of water this morning, really not effective right now, but they don't know, you know, but I had some sodas and I had some coffee and I, and I got a smoothie and like, okay, some hydration there, but can we get another couple of glasses in your day? Like simple things that we think of as duh, but we, we need to, to really understand where most people are and what the common lay understanding of so many things is. It's 180 degrees from where we're at right now as a profession. Yeah, well, it makes me kind of nervous, I'll say, or, or a low yeah. level of anxiousness, because I, I won't say generation, but if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, your lifestyle and your understanding of, of movement and let's just say uh, even work ethic, or it's different than if you grew up in the 90s compared to if you grew mm -hmm. up in the 2000s or the 2000 teens, right? Yeah. We're, we're seeing... A, a progression or a regression perhaps that mm -hmm. uh, the pain is normalized now. Everyone, mm -hmm. sh you know, it's, sure, it's weird if you're not pain. in pain, right? Uh, of course you're, you're 10 or 20 pounds or more overweight. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you you got injured when you went and, and did this or that. It's becoming so commonplace that I think we're going to lose touch with the fact that that should not be happening. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of normalizing of things that probably aren't, if we don't say normal, optimal for sure, for us as mm. a species, you know, taking, taking the value of normal out of it, probably not optimal for, for a healthy, pain-free or close to it as possible, long life. Now you do some consulting for, for trainers, right? Mm -hmm. so that, that's a big part of what you've, you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. What's, what does that look like? Like what, what kind of guidance especially in today's world, you just mentioned, you know, we're no longer in a five mile radius or five to 10 minute radius, so to speak. And now uh, you're only limited part, potentially by the language that you speak. As long as, long as you can yeah. speak English, you can, you can serve people that are English speaking all around the world, provided yeah. that you're in the right the time zones or whatever. Um, it, aside from that, what, what kind of advice do you give those conditioning coaches, strength coaches, personal trainers, and so on? Um, for for their goals in, in their career? I try to help them find their element. There's this idea, um, Sir Ken Robbins, who passed away about a year ago, but wrote a great book called The Element. And then he wrote an, a second book to that called Finding Your Element. But his idea, which I love, is that there's something that you do naturally very well and and sort of effortlessly. So you do it well and effortlessly, you have natural ability at it. There's this sort of zone of genius for each one of us. I love doing it. Sometimes we do things well and we don't love doing them. Like, oh yeah, I'm pretty good at that, but I, I think that's boring. But sometimes we do things really well and we're like, we could do them all day. And those are the places where we end up in flow state, where we lose track of time, where we just, you know, that's that's our, our happy place. And it's different for each of us. And my hope for people in the industry and when I when I've you know, counseled people and, and, and still do from time to time, you know, it's a conversation about what do you love doing? How can we find a path where you can be compensated to do that? And usually, especially with technology as, as one of the unlocks, usually there's a way, if not to make it a full profession pivot, to take some aspect of it that they can hopefully monetize, but minimally get some satisfaction so that when there's other aspects of their day and their job that they're less enamored with, they still had that passion, that fuel, that fire in their life in some way, shape or form. But in my mind, the optimal is that you love what you do, you're good at it, and you're getting compensated for it as well, so that you can live your passion, live the thing that, that you do best, your, I think, unique contribution, honestly, uh, to the profession, and you know, if you want to go there to the world. So I'm super passionate about helping people navigate that. Unfortunately or fortunately, it's not one size fits all. And a lot of people, and I've been here, which is the other lesson I've, I've learned a lot is, 
oh, I'll just follow so-and-so's path. And you think, well, that's well, well tread. Let me just get right behind them. But it, that breaks down pretty soon. You go a few feet with them. And then at some point you realize that you're a different person and the things that light them up or the directions they're going probably aren't exactly right for you. Maybe there's elements of it, but there's usually a point at which you have to make that road less traveled pivot of on your own. And that's a lonely place to go because you're a little bit finger to the wind. I don't know if this is right. And a little bit trial and error. And you do sort of have to do that. I mean, I've taken roles that I liked more than others and roles that I don't think any of them were, I regret, but were less of a fit for me. And I thought, okay, I'm going to stay here and learn this role. And this is what I hope to get out of it. But I don't see myself staying here for these reasons. And it's usually something in me is not lighting up when I work and I need that personally. Yeah, no, I, I get that. We always need a spark, something to kind of drive our interest and, and passion and yeah. sometimes found in the most unlikely places. Um, For sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's a few questions I have in mind. One is, are, are you you're happy with the direction that you're taking? And yeah. and because you're you've been all kind of geographically in different places and career wise, your path has changed here and there. Is it where you want it heading? And maybe I'm asking too personal a question. Are there yeah. some offshoots that you would like to explore? It's it's interesting where I'm at right now. It feels very serendipitous of the types of conversations. We're a startup. We're new to market. We're doing a lot of things, but the contributions I can make tend to draw on my different experiences. And it just, every time I'm like, wait, I, I have experience with that, or I know the answer to that. And it's just, it's unique because I, that wasn't the plan. And I think that's happens to a lot of us as we go further in our career, we can see in retrospect, sort of the perfection of the things that happened before and how they tee us up to do, to do work and bring contribution and ways we couldn't have if we didn't have those experiences. So where I'm at now, I've I'm, I'm been here in this role for, a, in with this company for a year and, and new, new in this role, I started as the head of talent and programming, so more on the video on demand side of the house. And now I'm moving into more corporate wellness spaces, but it's all drawing on things that I love, that I am passionate about, that I've done before, that I think I do well, that I have a point of view on. And that makes me want to get up in the morning when I feel like I can do good work, make a contribution, be challenged. And as long as that's happening for me, I'm really happy in my work life. And, and for me, that's always the goal. I, I, I can't punch a clock. You know, I, it just, I, I have to be engaged in my work or I get very, um, you know, frustrated um, pretty quickly because it's, it is so important to, to who I am as a person. Yeah, you mentioned you're, you're, uh, we're in charge of talent, kind of talent acquisition, which instantly with my mind, I, it, you know, you say squirrel and I start thinking about a whole bunch of things. And, I, <laughs> it, it, and this led me to Same. Cirque du Soleil. You know, Cirque du Soleil is still a privately held company, I think, out of Quebec, mm -hmm. as far as I know. But yeah. uh, one, I was watching some kind of episode about them and they have a vice president for creativity. I think that's what their role is. And cool. they would go out and they would scour the planet looking for those acts that mm -hmm. they could bring back into different shows, whether it was this little girl in Mumbai who could juggle something on a stick while she was in some kind of yoga pose or, or these Aquaman uh, mm -hmm. down in Southern California, high diving acts or something. So yeah. uh, when you say talent acquisition, I'm curious, how did you, were you scouring the planet? How would you get trainers or, or coaches or how, whatever kind of moniker we're putting on them? How, how did you acquire those? I'm curious. Yeah, so in my role, we've divided the talent into two pools. We have our one-on-one -on -one trainers and coaches, and then we have video on demand instructors. And there's some crossover there for sure. And within video on demand, we have eight different modalities. Uh, you know, bar, Pilates, yoga, strength, of course, recovery. These, these are the, the pieces. So we, we're an LA, Southern California focused company. So we've leaned in deep to who are the best of the best that we can identify in a boutique, in a boutique fitness sense here in this general area. So our people are Southern California based and then we, we vet them. We, we find out who people are liking, and then we find out if we think we vet them to see if we think they pass the sniff test, quite frankly, and from being a, a credible fitness professional, understanding that some of the, these modalities don't 
go cleanly through the filters that we as strength and conditioning professionals might use, but you wanna make sure there's nothing there that looks glaringly problematic before you bring them in. So there's a vetting. And then also because it is a entertainment experience, we have to bring some energy to it. So hopefully we find people that are engaging and compelling in that format and we coach them to be more so because we really want the expertise to shine, but we also want people to be excited, engage and having fun. So they want to come back again. So it's this balance of expertise and entertainment that gets them to come back and partake in the expertise. So you've got filming studios then, I imagine, yeah. right? Yeah. In different yeah, locations? Studio in, in uh, Culver City that we film most of our content out of. And, uh, and you know, that's where the, the instructors would come and when we film and we've banked a ton of content. We have over a thousand classes in our bank and I think 700 on the device already with more to come. So a lot of classes yeah. for a small new company. Sure. You've been, you've been out there in the public for a year now, you say? Yeah, about a year. Um, and a little slower sometimes than we want with supply chain. We're finally not in a good spot with supply chain. So uh, starting to move quickly. And, and that's exciting for all of us because we've just been waiting for the pandemic to go away and make, make things move a little faster. Yeah, I think we're all waiting for that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting. Um, I, I want to talk about um, the workforce, if you yeah. don't mind, because we're sure. everyone's struggling in, in regards to finding staff, at least mm -hmm. those in the industry that I speak to. I don't know of anybody that has an easy time finding mm -hmm. staff, no matter how they try and to try and go about doing it, whether they get recruiting software or online, or if they're just word of mouth, or they're mm -hmm. using their in-house trainers to spread the word. There's a whole bunch of ways, of course, but the sure. bottom line is, is that it, it seems like, I won't say there's a, a shortage, but the, they're elusive is mm -hmm. really, it's, it's, there's elusive staff, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Do you, do you have any suggestions to the studio yeah. owners who want to get out of the day-to-day, the -day, I won't say grind, but the day-to-day -day training so they could expand their business, but they are pulled back into it because their staff numbers are very low and they have to provide the services that before they had more staff to do that for. For sure. And, you know, I think some of this is changing now that we're slowly getting back to more in real life. So some of this, I think, will correct a bit on its own. But to your point, I think there's two main things that people can do. One is to create a culture of excellence. And in my mind, that excellence is powered by education being at the forefront of what we do, that we are, none of us are done learning. You know, Michelangelo yeah. said, I'm still learning. And he was what, like 80 at that point or something. <laughs> so we're, none of us are finished. We're all learning. We're all developing. We're all getting new skills. And you make that culture loud and clear and you encourage your staff that you do have to invite their friends. You give that education out. You, it doesn't have to, we don't, I think sometimes we think these things and we overthink them. It's like, it could be a brown bag lunch and learn. And somebody like yourself, who is you know, a person with tremendous expertise in a variety of, of, of areas can spend 40 minutes talking about a topic and answering questions. As veterans in the field, we sometimes underestimate how much value that brings to an, a, a newer, trainer they're like whoa I didn't know any of that and they're writing down this and I should read this book and I should check out this this professional and their work and it just opens so many doors I think the word of mouth from that is a contagion and in my experience when we've done this well in the places that I've worked before you know it they're bringing their friend bringing their friend and that's they're your brand advocates your current staff and then they, you know, they advocate to their friends who have similar passions and interests. And before you know it, you have more staff. And yes, you're going to probably find these are newer people that you're going to have to train. But that is ultimately sometimes, and you've been there, sometimes it's a better yeah. thing because sometimes you're training people who are, who are open-minded and eager to learn versus untraining people who have a very fixed notion about what should be done. Uh, that's a lot more work. Pain, it's painful. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, painful and arduous and, and the energy it takes. It's amazing. I mean, I just know how much I had to unlearn before before really following the path I'm on right now. And that was all of it. That, all exhausting. Of us, but you have humility and not everybody has humility. So I think cool. that's one thing. And the other thing that just more tactical and operational, 
I think looking at your existing clientele for either if, if they don't want to, I bet they're one degree of separation. So many times, some of the best hires we had were people that were former clients. And you think, well, you know, you cannibalize your client base. Not too much. You get more <laughs> juice out of having that great professional working for you many times than having a client. So sometimes it's the client. Sometimes it's the client's significant other, child, best friend who's in a different moment that you don't have you know, they used to work in this, in an industry and they want to pivot, but they're passionate about fitness. So I think that's the other thing, reaching out. We were very successful sometimes of flywheel sports when we would see a, someone who was a passionate rider in the indoor cycling space and we'd see them show up and their form was great. We'd be like, did you ever think about teaching? And they'd be like, oh no, I could never teach. We're like, maybe, maybe not, but why don't you come with us and let's, uh, and like, let's try some classes and see how you feel. And we can, and a lot of times those people became our best instructors over time. So it's pretty cool. That's great. Okay. One more question is yeah. the, just the future of the larger health clubs, because they, of course, just like so many other businesses took a, a massive hit in the last two and a half years with yes. shutting down and some were overextended. And of course they had to fold and we've seen so many gyms close their doors yeah. never to open again. Yeah. Where is there going to be a resuscitation? Do you think, I mean, there, it's never going away obviously, but is it going to change? Like is, is the way in which memberships are sold or the, the cost of memberships? What, what do you think is happening there? I think it's been changed forever changed for better and for worse. And I think we can argue it both ways, but I think, the hybrid model is going to be here to stay. And, and it will be interesting to see how much people index on one or the other. But I think the idea that people can have access to you as a fitness professional and your expertise, wherever they are, not just when they're in a brick and mortar space is here to stay. I think the convenience of it, you know, God forbid we have another outbreak of something else, you know, so we have that whole thing. But I think just the idea that people now know I can do this and get a 30 minute session in before I go to work. I don't have to drive somewhere. This fits into my life. So maybe one on Saturday, I come in in real life, but you know, these other days I do it from home. I think just gives so many more options to people, so much more access to people. And I think it, it gives us the ability where we've all been there, where my clients in New York would be like, well, leaving for the Hamptons in July, I'll see you in two months. And I didn't make revenue for two months and that was not easy for me. And now I would say, okay, well, bring your iPad. And in our case, I'd say, get your form studio and let's put it out there because we're going to be training together. There's no excuse. You don't want people to fall off. And by the way, people, people it's not very, it's not really self-serving because people would come back eight weeks later and we had a lot of things to undo. <laughs> <laughs> things had really fallen apart, you know, on all levels, nutrition, you know, just, they just weren't taking care of themselves. And just to be able to be in there to say, hey, I'm here wherever you are serving you in some way, shape or form. And it's not tied to you showing up at this building at this time. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So we've got job security is what you're saying. I think we do. I think we do. <laughs> For a long time to come. I just wish we bring more people over to, to work with us. But I think we have job security. Well, let's throw out some, some information in terms of uh, form. And, and if people are looking, are you still offering consultations to, or consulting uh, services? Yeah, I mean, I'm available to, to talk to people. If, if, if they want to work through some things, they can certainly reach out to me. If they're interested in finding out more about form and what we do, I would love to hear from them. They can reach me there. It's my first name dot last name at formlife.com. Uh, Geraldine Cooper, dot Coopersmith at formlife.com. They can reach me through uh, Coopersmith Consulting. It's Gerilyn at coopersmithconsulting.com. I, I am very passionate about keeping people who want to be in this industry, in this industry, productive, you know, able to support themselves and have some quality of life for as long as they want to be in this profession. And it, 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 if I do that in my career, that will really make me very satisfied. I'll be able to, to go out a very happy woman. So uh, anything I can do in the service of that personally and professionally, I'm here for it. 
Uh, beautiful. And for the listening audience, don't forget in August at Perform Better Training Summit three-day event in Providence, Rhode Island, Gerilyn's going to be speaking there as well. So you can go to performbetter.com. I'll make sure all the information is in the description below the podcast. But uh, thank Thanks. you so much for coming on. I really had a great thank time. Thank you. So lovely to, to see you. I wish we were going to be at the same one. I heard you rocked it in Orlando. So uh, hopefully we'll next year we'll be on the same uh, venue one of the dates. Yeah, I had them infuse hallucinogens through the air system. So <laughs> everyone was having a great time. Let me know That's the it. recipe. I'll need some. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we come to a close with the episode of Zealous Podcast. I uh, hope you enjoyed some of those tidbits Gerilyn was sharing. And if you are in the Providence area this August, be sure to check out the Perform Better three-day training summit. She's got a lot of information there, plus some amazing other presenters there. In the meantime... Subscribe to the channel, tell others, and we'll see you next week.